Good afternoon. Good afternoon. That's more like it. <laughs> My name is Chiedo Wangwo. I am the Vice Dean for Education and Academic Affairs. I also direct the Seismic Lead and teach classes in African politics. I am delighted, as you can see, <laughs> to welcome you to this event with such a distinguished guest in conversation with Dean Steinberg. Before I continue, I will interrupt myself to thank the people that made this event possible today. From the Dean's office, Daniel Kahn and Gabby Roberts Handy. From events, Brittany Menina, Sonia Holmes, Jessica Marino, and Destiny Curtis. And from IT, Moelahi, Pedro Matias, Ariana, and others. Thank you. I am black. Hello. <laughs> I am American. I am African. I am human. I'm sure these assertions, by their very nature, twist themselves into concentric circles in your mind. And the core of the circle subsists in the most salient of these consciousness, an identity for our lived experiences. These assertions of consciousness should not constitute a threat one way or the other. Instead, they should be the canvas on which we paint our individuality and commonality all at once. And as America celebrates black history, here at size, we acknowledge and work within certain parameters. That history is never finished. It is not deterministic. It is not a product of random collision not driven by chance. Rather, it is orchestrated by human agency. It is alive and continuing. And we are more determined than ever to play our part in history, black history, by celebrating and respecting our uniqueness, striving to correct past mistakes holding up the ladder one for another, and being intentional in our remediation initiatives. So, to summarize, we are intentional about remembering the past and reimagining the future. Leading that charge is our very own Dean Steinberg, who of course is no stranger to us, my boss, Dean Steinberg has straddled for well over four decades and masterfully at that, the worlds of scholarship, public service, and scholarly activism. His years serving in the White House as policy advisor and in other roles ranging from diplomatic to administrative uniquely positions him to lead this institution with understanding, empathy, and a depth of knowledge and skills that is transformative, both for the institution and its constituent groups. Again, history is alive and happening in our very eyes. And Dean Steinberg's part in this history is unfolding, inspiring, and uplifting. Hey. <laughs> our guest today, Travis Atkins, embodies the very essence of black history, a celebration of black achievement and black excellence, and an unyielding belief in rolled up sleeves in partnering with Africa to ensure that reparation continue to exist in our imaginary, however conceived. Travis Atkins is the 10th president and chief executive officer of the United States African Development Foundation. Previously, he served as the Deputy Assistant Administrator for Africa at the U.S. Agency for International Development, you see. 
Mr. Atkins is also a lecturer of African and Security Studies at the Walsh School of Foreign Service at Georgetown University. <laughs> where he currently teaches in the Prison Scholars Program of Georgetown's Prison and Justice Initiative. As an international development leader, he has over two decades of experience working in governance, education, humanitarian affairs, and women and youth empowerment in over 50 nations throughout Africa and the Middle East. So you can see why he's very popular here at, uh, at our sites. If you look at our events list, you see that we're going to have him again this month. <laughs> this includes serving as staff director of the House Subcommittee on Africa, working with leading international NGOs and think tanks, as well as within several branches of the United States system, United Nations system. He's an alumnus of the International Affairs Fellowship at the Council on Foreign Relations a former senior fellow of the Africa program at the Center for Strategic and International Studies, and a recipient of academic appointments from Carnegie Mellon and New York universities. Mr. Atkins has served in numerous international election observation missions and in Africa and the Middle East with the National Democratic Institute, is a regular contributor to national and international media outlets on African affairs, and is a life member of the Council on Foreign Relations. He holds master's degree in international affairs and education from the New School and Lemon College, and is a graduate of Fisk University, one of our nation's illustrious historically black colleges and universities. Um, you can follow him at Travis L. Atkins on Twitter. And so join me in welcoming uh, Dean Steinberg and Mr. Travis Atkins. Well, thank you, Dean Runcor, for that uh, very generous introduction, and more importantly, for your extraordinary leadership here uh, at SAIS. It's uh, great to have you as a partner, and I know everybody uh, in the school really values the extraordinary contribution you're making. And thanks to all the people you thanked uh, who helped put this event together, and uh, a variety of people, including the number of people from the leadership of, of the school here, Dean Baker, uh, and our other deans, Dean Jackson and, and, and the like, uh, who are here. I really appreciate you. There are so many people who uh, have play a key role at the, at the university uh, who are, and at the school who are here for this very special event. And a real honor for me to be able to share the stage with you. Um, you know, you heard from uh, Dean Wonkor this extraordinary career that you've, you've had. And because we are here in a, a school of, of international affairs, I always like to start out by having you share with me a little bit about your professional journey. How, how did you even get interested in this in the first place? I mean, a lot of our young students, particularly from uh, you know, historically underrepresented minorities in international affairs, you know, are wondering about what the paths are into this. So maybe if you could share us a little bit about your own journey and how you ended up uh, with the opportunity to serve in so many important positions. Sure, thank you so much. And I never take it for granted when anybody comes out to hear um, anything I have to say. So thank you guys so much for joining. Um, to, to, to give a short answer uh, to the question and then to elaborate a little bit, um, I find that our field is very much like uh, the music industry. Uh, sometimes you get uh, you know, discovered singing on the subway, sometimes you're playing on the sidewalk, uh, other times you send in a demo tape or a CD or whatever the thing you send in now <laughs> is, and uh, you know, there can be some electricity around what it is that you're putting out into the world. But more specific for me personally, um, this um, really was always a kind of vocation uh, that grabbed me uh, at a very early point um, in my life, uh, being from Tennessee, uh, being uh, ensconced in uh, a neighborhood of, of poverty, um, the way that I really started to get into this direction is looking out into the world through the innocence of a child, being told that if I just did my homework and listened and obeyed my parents, that everything would be okay. Uh, and I was doing those things and I realized that everything was not um, okay. I saw um, the way that police engage with people in our neighborhoods. I saw the condition uh, of the schools that we had to go to and the hospitals that we had access to. And I had a family uh, who was insistent that there was a linkage between what was happening to us at home uh, and what was happening abroad. Uh, and one story that I tell sometimes is that on one of the days when I was particularly curious, asking my mom uh, these kinds of questions, 
Uh, she said, son, I don't know uh, the answer to your questions, but what I can tell you uh, it is, is that it is connected to our history, uh, having arrived to this place uh, from Africa. And so very early on, there is this notion that history has an implication for the present. There is the, the notion that things that are very far away can have an implication for things that are very close to you. And there is the notion that if you look backwards, you can figure out the way uh, to move forward. And so from that point on, uh, really she set me on a journey, uh, seven, eight, nine years old, where I became totally obsessed uh, with this history, uh, with what had happened, with this idea that history uh, is really not a thing of the past, but is a thing that is present with us. And I started out wanting to be a scholar uh, and an academic, uh, but I realized uh, pretty quickly, at least for me, uh, not to um, uh, kind of castigate us academics and scholars, but to say for me that the reading and the writing and the speaking, I felt wasn't enough. And so there was this idea of rolling up uh, my sleeves and getting engaged in the world, first starting where I lived, uh, because I had a very practical set uh, of black women who were bringing me along. And the question that they would always ask is, how can you want to do something for people 10,000 miles away that you won't even do in a 10 block radius of where you live? So I started where I was, using what I had, doing what I can, uh, as Arthur has said. Uh, but then another rejoinder that I came back to them with was, they would ask you know, you know, this question, am I my brother's keeper, right? And if you answer that question, yes, uh, then what if your brother or sister is in Haiti or the Dominican Republic or the Congo or Sudan or Tanzania? Don't you still have a responsibility uh, to push back against uh, systems and histories uh, that have put people who come from places like us um, at a disadvantage? Uh, and so I set out uh, with that as the mission and purpose uh, of my life. That's a, that's a terrific story. And as you entered this world, you know, sort of particularly thinking after you finished your studies at uh, another distinguished school, Masters of International Affairs, how did you kind of work your way through the system? How, how our students in particular are interested in sort of yeah. how you pursue your career? Once you found your passion, Absolutely. how do you then pursue the career? Absolutely. I, the first thing I would say is that most of the opportunities that I have ever received were because of the kind of person that I was trying to be. It wasn't the name of the school that I came from. It wasn't that I had a family that could get open doors for me and things of that nature. It was that I possessed the ability uh, to demonstrate passion, uh, to demonstrate kindness, to not be uh, interactional, or, or excuse me, transactional in the kinds of relationships that I was building with mentors uh, and older colleagues. Uh, in my field. Uh, the second thing uh, that I got early on from mentors was to develop yourself on two fronts, a regional interest and a topical interest. And so that could be water and sanitation in Africa, or that could be maternal and child health in Latin America, right? Being able to move um, in that way. Uh, the third thing, I had two groups of mentors that gave two different sets of advice. One group said to pick one thing and drill down on it and become the best that you can at it. And another group said, no, you're too young. Do all kinds of different things. Figure out what you like, figure out what you don't like, um, and go in that direction. Uh, and that second group was the one that I followed for a very practical reason. And that is when you're starting out, you really don't have the leverage to only pick one thing. You have to take what you can get. And so if I could find an internship on malaria, even though I ultimately wanted to work on refugees, the logic for me was, don't refugees have to deal with the challenge of malaria? Of course they do, or water and sanitation, or whatever the case uh, may be. But the constant through all of that was the African region, uh, was African uh, people. Uh, one of the things that I, I will tell you this story, it's a little funny, I used to be a, a fourth grade teacher uh, in the Bronx, and one summer, I got invited to be uh, a kind of a counselor at this youth uh, program. And it turned out uh, that the youth program was actually funded by the, the kind of rapper, hip hop mogul at that time, P. Diddy, Sean Puffy Combs. I mean, he's had so many different, so many different names, but I went to that camp uh, and I taught this course 
on the uh, European colonization of Africa uh, to elementary school kids for the summer, which sounds terrible from, from their perspective, <laughs> right? But it actually ended up being really amazing. And the thing that kind of launched me uh, essentially is that Diddy, he used to come to the class. And so he would see uh, the impact that this was having on these young people. And after the camp was over, they actually asked me if I wanted to come and work for them. And I'm, I'm saying, well, how? You know, I'm not an entertainer, I'm not a rapper, I'm not, you know, that kind of thing. And they said, well, look, we want to do kind of documentary film work, uh, and if you're willing to come work with us, uh, we would love to send you to Ethiopia. Now, I had never been to Africa um, at that time. And so this is kind of the randomness of the field, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, making the analogy uh, of the music industry, uh, that it turns out that my first time in Africa is because I went to this camp and I was working with these kids and I was teaching about what I loved and somebody who could have an influence intervened and gave me uh, an opportunity. And so I went to Ethiopia through that process. Uh, I have many stories like that that have happened throughout the early part of my career and continue to happen where these so-called chance encounters, when you're found uh, doing what you love and demonstrating a talent and a passion and a capacity for learning and a kindness and a respect for other people uh, ends up opening doors that you just could not have imagined. And so for me, uh, I think humility is something that comes very, very, very easily because I could have had all the talent in the world and if the few people uh, who came along the way didn't come, I wouldn't be here and could have gone off course uh, in a negative aspect in terms of what was in my environment uh, and the life opportunities that were presented at, to me from an early stage. And so I think of it as being about the kind of person uh, that you are, uh, how you treat people, the ways in which you express gratitude, uh, and the ways in which you drive, drive, drive home about what it is you're passionate about changing uh, in the world and getting yourself around people who have similar kinds of interests. You know, I, I just got to smile because, you know, I, I like you, spent a lot of time talking to young people about these choices. And, you know, I, I feel so much the same way, that you got to be open to opportunities. Don't keep your narrow bore. Don't think you know what it is. There's no straight line path to where you want to get to. It's zigs and zags. And right. It's open opportunities. That's a powerful statement and, and no better illustration than the one you just gave about meeting Diddy and getting to go to Africa. That's great. Um, so uh, I'm not sure that all the people here know a lot about the foundation. Yes. Um, and you know, how it came about, what its mission is, how it relates to the more traditional things like your previous job at USAID. So yeah. maybe just you know, share with us a little bit about the foundation, your role there, your mission and all yeah, that. Yeah, absolutely. So the U.S. African Development Foundation uh, is in fact the only U.S. foreign assistance agency that is solely focused on the continent of Africa. So obviously other agencies have bureaus and divisions and so forth, uh, but the mission of our entire agency is dedicated uh, to the continent. We were founded and established by Congress uh, in 1980. Um, and our goal uh, was pretty clear and straightforward. One, that there were many of the larger uh, US uh, development foreign assistance agencies that were doing great work, but they were still gaps in people that they could reach in communities that didn't necessarily get the benefit of what it was that they were trying to put forward. And so they devised us uh, to have a localized development approach uh, to invest directly uh, in African uh, entrepreneurs and enterprises so we don't fund people through kind of US-based NGOs. We don't have expats that are out there leading the charge uh, all across the continent, 100% uh, uh, of our staff on the continent are African nationals of the countries uh, in which they serve. Uh, and that goes, I think, to this conversation that has been going on over the last few years of notions of decolonization, decolonizing aid, and so forth, uh, looking at ways in which we put our partners um, in the place to lead uh, the effort. And so for USADF, because we have that approach, we don't show up in a nation telling people what they should do. Uh, we show up in people's nation asking them what they are doing uh, and how we uh, can be supportive. Uh, that usually takes the form of kind of interventions that relate to agriculture and agribusiness, um, also climate and energy, um, and then also entrepreneurship uh, and vocational training. And so the idea really 
is how can we support communities across the continent to lift themselves economically, right? So there is all kinds of political challenges, there is all kinds of issues with conflict and global health and things of that nature, uh, but I would submit uh, that the driving charge is that these nations don't have strong enough economic engines uh, to develop themselves and to provide the appropriate services uh, for their citizenry. And so for us, our unit of measure is the individual, is the community. So we don't have the supposition that the kind of assistance we are providing will change a nation or transform a nation. We're looking at helping people to transform their lives, helping communities to transform themselves, uh, focusing on small and medium-sized enterprises under the guise that they are. Uh, they make up 90% of all businesses globally, even in the United States. And so with a focus there, uh, the hope is that we can help these folks uh, build more viable uh, enterprises uh, to have a greater economic base for themselves uh, and the aspirations that they have for themselves and, and their families for the future. So a lot of people, when they talk about Africa and African development, they point to some of the positive indicators, right? You have a, a number of countries in, in the continent who are among the fastest growing in, in the world, of a young demographic, which is usually the, the hallmark of uh, the countries that have great uh, potential. Talk to us a little bit about how you, where you see the real opportunities there and, and, and how is this kind of developing over time? Yeah, you know, one of the uh, talking points that I've been developing a, a theme around is this idea um, that for me in Washington uh, and maybe in the circles of policy, maybe even in your classrooms, uh, there is this notion of women and youth, women and, women and youth, women and youth, almost as if it's a singular word uh, and, and, and also as if these are kind of small niche populations, uh, special interest lobbies, uh, if you will, uh, when the fact is uh, that both are the overwhelming majority of the population on the continent. Uh, and so you can't be seriously engaged on the continent if you don't have a proper focus on women, uh, if you don't have a proper focus uh, on youth. Uh, as it is said, a nation uh, is rarely can rise higher than the status uh, of its women. Uh, it's also said that you can tell a lot about a nation by the way it treats uh, its youth, uh, its young people. Uh, and so that is where uh, a great deal of our focus is, especially because we essentially believe that Africa uh, is not only the continent of the future, but the continent of now. And that if you can harness uh, the capacity, the genius, the energy, the vitality uh, of African women uh, and youth, uh, you would have the ability to catapult your nation uh, forward into the future in ways that might help you to leapfrog uh, in terms of technology uh, and innovation, in ways that might help you to deal with the challenges uh, that climate change is fast uh, bringing uh, to um, the continent and to uh, the global community. Uh, and so those are some of the ways in which we kind of look to engage. Um, and look, historically we had been focused uh, kind of around the Horn of Africa, uh, the Sahel, uh, and the Great Lakes. Uh, and a big part of what I would like to do is to be able to expand our reach uh, into North Africa, into the island nations of the continent, into Southern Africa. Uh, and there is some conversation uh, in our field about the status really of middle-income countries uh, and some of the kinds of assistance that they cannot access, uh, but they still have pockets of deep need even in those nations across the continent. And so I'm looking for ways in which we can intervene there uh, and hopefully give communities uh, a fighting chance. You know, one of the things that when you think about the development of human capital about young people, obviously, is education, right? Yeah. And, and talk to me and us about a little bit about how you see the landscape there. Particularly, obviously, there's a huge need at the very basic level for yeah. literacy and the like, but also at the higher levels. Um, you know, the whole issue about the brain drain, the question of how do you get people to, to both have the kind of higher education, tertiary education institutions, and then get people to want to stay and invest. Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, I, like I said, I was a fourth grade teacher and now I'm teaching at the university level. Uh, and so that's always uh, a big focus uh, of mine now. In terms of our agency, our primary focus in terms of education really is vocational, right? And the way in which we would approach that is that when we enter a country or we're working in a country, um, there might be the ability to partner with a technical college or a training facility that can provide a certain type of technical skill. Uh, what we would always want to do is have a market survey of what businesses 
in that country or in that region are looking for and then partner with a local partner uh, to develop programs that can provide that kind of training. Uh, and the way that we deal with gender in that uh, is usually 50% of the people that come into that program would be young women, 50% would be young men, and then the businesses that we partner with thereafter, uh, we would have signed an MOU with them to hire 85 to 100% uh, of the people that come into those programs. And so essentially, if you make it through, uh, more or less you would be guaranteed um, a job. And I think that trying to make community um, viable and attractive for investment and for growth um, is one of the things that would help deal with the brain drain, uh, might help deal with some of the challenges of migration. Uh, people, of course, all over the continent who risk their lives and who we lose uh, in the desert and in the sea uh, because they didn't believe they had a viable chance uh, to have a successful life uh, in the place uh, where they lived. And I actually, I read a statistic on this, uh, a passage from a book uh, not too long ago, and it said that the, the largest mass grave uh, for Africans uh, in the modern world uh, is the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, and I was really shook mm. by the, the weight of what that means and how desperate people are uh, to find ways um, to have the kind of lives that they want. And what our agency is focused on is trying to give it to them in a local context uh, right where they are. You've worked both in the executive branch and in Congress. Um, I'd be interested in your own perception, particularly as you interact now with, with uh, the Biden administration and also with the Hill, how much understanding and appreciation there are of these issues of the work you're doing, where's the support coming from, what are the challenges that you face? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, I'm, I'm very excited about uh, the Africa Leaders Summit that we just had at the end of last year, uh, some of the outstanding kind of partnerships and commitments uh, that came out of that, the tone and tenor uh, of that meeting, which really was about partnership and engagement, uh, getting us away, I think, uh, from the sense uh, in the West of this kind of tough love, lecturing, admonishing relationship uh, with the continent uh, and changing that around. And so uh, that's really exciting. Uh, I think also uh, we have an opportunity now uh, with a, a increased focus on diaspora communities and their engagement uh, with the United States government and in Africa, uh, looking again at the post-COVID recovery, uh, economic growth, uh, the increase in two-way trade uh, and development uh, between the U.S. Um, and African nations. Uh, and hopefully that would set the stage uh, for more successful talks in terms of governance challenges, in terms of security challenges, in terms of counterterrorism and other kinds of cooperation uh, that the U.S. might want to engage in um, on the continent. The biggest thing for me personally is the emphasis on partnering with Africa for the benefits that we can gain and we can share with our African partners, not solely because of other kinds of global competition uh, that we might be uh, concerned with. And so for me, uh, engaging in Africa uh, on its own terms for its own wealth and value uh, to the United States and, and in partnership, uh, I think is really important uh, because I think not doing it that way is one of the reasons why we can get behind the curve. Right, you anticipated my next question there. Bring um, it on. Which is, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, it, it, there's almost no conversation that we have in this room or any other room that doesn't have the word China in it. Um, mm -hmm. And and as you said, I mean, this is the, for many, uh, just as we saw in the Cold War, right? There's a there's a tendency to instrumentalize our relations, not just with Africa, but other parts of the world as well. Yeah. How much of a problem is this in your work? And, and how do you deal with the fact that, you know, the, the positive side is people are more motivated to pay more attention, but for the reasons you said, it may not be for kind of for the intrinsic value of, of the engagement. Yeah. Well, you know, I think going back a little bit to the history of how I got into this field and, and the things that my mother and family uh, guided me towards, uh, the value of Africa and the value of African people was always very clear uh, to me. And as we celebrate Black History Month, I think about this theme because uh, essentially, you know, the 12 million uh, African uh, men and women brought to America uh, in the transatlantic slave trade who were brought here uh, to have their labor uh, extracted from them under force created uh, the economic engine and conditions 
uh, for this nation to become one of the most economically uh, and militarily powerful uh, in the history of the world. And so um, I say that because there are so many questions about why Africa should matter to the United States, why should we engage, why should it be uh, prioritized. Uh, and as I once heard President Clinton say, uh, there are few uh, nations on the earth who've received more benefit from Africa um, than America. And so we have historical ties, but also uh, the immediacy of the present moment uh, as reasons why uh, we should be uh, strategically engaged. I would say uh, that in our work, um, we help in that relationship because we actually are not focused on that relationship, right? So when you talk about USADF, you're talking about people to people uh, engagement. Because our staff are all Africans, are all nationals of the countries in which they work, uh, the insight that they provide, the relationships uh, that they have, the way in which their knowledge of their nations and regions allows us to reach people uh, that might not go, uh, or that might go without uh, certain kinds of support if we couldn't get to them, it puts us in a different position. And I think, uh, when I think about our, our congressional mandate, it talks about USADF's uh, core role, making friends for America in Africa and vice versa. And so we take that seriously. And so I think if you focus on it in the way that it deserves, uh, in some ways it takes care of some of the other competitive things because you're actually doing right uh, by people in the engagements that you have, regardless of what someone else uh, decides to do or say or prioritize. And of course we know uh, that global competition is a real thing, so I'm not naive to suggest that we are operating in a world where those things are not at play, but it is just to say that for me, uh, African people in the Africa region uh, deserve uh, the kinds of high level focus that we would give to any other part of the world, especially because we're calling ourselves a global leader. Uh, and you can't be a global leader if you're gonna ignore large swaths of the globe. So interesting that you highlight in the mission, it's making friends for the United States, right? So I don't think it's an accident or a surprise thing, but that the US brand, especially with respect to issues like race, um, is not, unchallenged right now and then because of all the challenges that we face here and the really serious problems that continue to plague the United States. How, how, and you mentioned obviously some of it you have, your staff are not American, they're African, but you're still, if your mission is to make friends for America, how do you deal with the fact that, that we aren't the most shining image in the mm -hmm. world, especially with respect to issues that Africans will care about? Sure, sure. Well, I think for me it's, it's very easy and it's very clear. Uh, I think the first thing is to not pretend that history has not happened, uh, to not pretend that the things that happened before our time have no implication or bearing on what is happening uh, today. Uh, and I think creating a space for that kind of truth in our engagement uh, is a critical, a critical part uh, of this. Uh, I think, again, for me, uh, as a black American, it's very clear uh, that that shining example that doesn't exist necessarily always uh, in a foreign policy sense, certainly has not always existed uh, in a domestic sense. I was given a talk earlier today where I shared uh, that at 47 uh, years old, I'm actually the first person in, in the history of my entire family uh, to be born free and a full citizen uh, of the United States of America. And so in a sense, even though my family has been here for over 200 years, uh, I am in essence a first generation American, right? Even my mother could not vote uh, when she turned 18. Certainly my grandmothers and grandfathers and all before them uh, could not. Uh, but I think that that allows us, if we will use the diversity as a strength in our nation, uh, to reflect the world back to itself. Uh, because I cannot say uh, that uh, when we engage on democracy, uh, that we have uh, the moral standing to do so without acknowledging uh, that history, right? And myself being a son of communities uh, that have fought that, fought, fought that fight, excuse me, um, I think it's critical to do. So when I'm engaging in Namibia, when I'm engaging in South Africa, apartheid, Jim Crow, all of these things come up. Uh, and I think facing them head on and not feeling the need to ignore or to run away from them helps us. Uh, I was talking earlier today and I gave this analogy of kind of when you play as children and you know you hide under a sheet 
and you're thinking that because you can't see <laughs> your friends that they can't see you, right? You're this big hump under the sheet thinking that you're, thinking that you're hiding. And I think for us uh, in our diplomatic engagements, everybody else all over the world has seen these things. They saw January the 6th. They saw uh, George Floyd in a nine-minute uh, video. They saw Abu Ghraib. They see all of these things. And so for us to try to pretend uh, that none of that is happening and go forward as a moral authority uh, will, I think, uh, need to be uh, rethought. And uh, I'm glad to be a part uh, of this uh, current administration uh, and of an organization uh, that's working to do that, that has an eye towards that and has a narrative around that uh, that gives all of us the ability uh, politically to move forward and to speak uh, in those terms. You know, for a long time, um, there's been a lot of discussion about uh, the opportunities and the need for more intra-African cooperation. Mm -hmm. You know, the evolution, the RAU into the AU, uh, the privilege when I was uh, a deputy secretary to represent the United States at one of the AU summits. How do you assess the, the ability of the countries now to work together, and how, how important is that from your perspective in terms of the likelihood of success in meeting some of these economic and other challenges that you talked yeah, about? Yeah, I think, you know, um, here's what I would say. When I think about America, when I think about Africa, there are two processes that come to mind. One is kind of, you know, the civil rights movement. One is the decolonization process. Uh, both are spoken of uh, in the past tense, but in fact, both are still ongoing, right? It's not over. As you can see on the continent, it's not over, um, as you can see uh, in the streets of America. And so I think, obviously, there is a need for regional integration uh, more strongly uh, across the continent, infrastructure uh, that can help countries um, to engage in terms of their own intra-African trade in a, in a stronger way. Uh, but the thing that I look at that gives me uh, hope, one, is that most African nations have only been independent uh, for about 60, 70 years now, which means they're very early in the processes of national cohesion, the formation of governance, and so forth. And so I don't get hopeless, or I'm not pes pessimistic about these things, right? Because if you look, I mean, 60 or 70 years after 1776 is 1826, 1836. And where were we at that time? Certainly not where we are today, certainly not as far along the road of our progression as maybe we would have hoped uh, to be based on the ideals that we were putting forward. And so I would extend that grace to other peoples uh, and other regions uh, of the world. One more for me, and then I'm gonna turn to the audience so get your questions ready. But um, we're talking about economic development growth. Um, your foundation, the US government plays a role, but we've all learned that in many ways, it's the private sector, private capital, trade, investment that makes the difference. How engaged are you with the private sector, and how, how does the foundation work with the private sector, and what do you see as the opportunities there? Yeah, we're very engaged with the private sector. So leveraging uh, the congressional funds we have is a key priority, not only of the agency, but particularly for me uh, in my tenure. So we partner really across three different kind of levels. Our first level of partnership is actually country partnerships with the nations uh, in which we work. And in those partnerships, Oftentimes, we're doing actually co-funded uh, development assistance work in that country. So we just signed one at the Africa Leaders Summit with Namibia. We have others um, in Nigeria, in Kenya, in other places um, where essentially that nation has identified a need, uh, has identified perhaps a budget shortcoming. Uh, we come together, develop an MOU, and we co-fund uh, those initiatives for women, for youth, for entrepreneurs. Uh, the other partnership level that we have uh, is interagency partnerships with the DFC, with USAID, with the State Department, and others, again, allowing us to leverage the U.S. taxpayer dollar and to bring more resources uh, to the continent. And the third is exactly where you're going, uh, which is with private uh, uh, institutions, um, the private sector, if you will. And so that is Stand Big Bank, that is MasterCard, that is City, that is the National Basketball Players Association uh, and others who find uh, the model and the approach uh, that we have, the agility that we have as an agency, uh, they find that attractive uh, for the means in which uh, they want to engage on the continent and the kinds of outcomes they want to see 
uh, for people um, in their communities. That's great. Um, and they can be powerful when they get in there. It's, yes. Uh, all right, let me uh, open it up to questions from, from the audience. Take advantage of this extraordinary opportunity here. Who wants to start us off? All right, we'll start in the back row here. I think there's a mic uh, if you need it. it uh, Working, but maybe you all can still there hear me. Perfect. Um, my name is Denise Kirkpatrick. I am a first year doctoral and international affairs student. Um, and I would like to thank uh, all of our leaders here today for hosting this wonderful Black History event. Um, and also, you know, as a sixth generation American, uh, descendant of Free Frank, who was the first African American to establish a city in the United States, I'm very pleased that you wove in your story and how, as a child, your mother wove in the importance of connecting with ancestry and how that influenced you today. Um, and I think that's important, particularly as the conversation around diaspora comes up. Um, I will say I was very pleased to see the Biden administration announce a new diaspora council, um, but I am concerned that we aren't having a conversation um, among civil society, among academia, about what that means and what that looks like and bringing the diaspora community to the table. Because I think oftentimes when you hear the term, you think of first generation immigrants from the continent. Um, and I say that because I think it's important when we talk about it, we include those who have historical ties to the United States for generations. Um, and I recently published an article at the Atlantic Council that speaks to the role and influence of African Americans in encouraging this movement in Ghana through Kwame Nkrumah to make FIFA, the soccer institution, more inclusive, okay? My question to you, um, Mr. Atkins, is what role is your organization playing or where do you think your, your organization can play in facilitating these conversations in diaspora and engaging um, both communities, uh, descendants of enslaved Africans, uh, Africans, as well as immigrant Africans, about the future of the continent, but also the benefits of economic development in African American communities in the United States. Sure. Thank you for thank you for the question uh, and the context that you provided to go with it. Uh, for me, I think uh, obviously I take um, the word and the phrase framing of diaspora in the broadest sense, right? And I think there, there are two, right? There's the historical diaspora and the contemporary diaspora. But when I speak of the one word, I'm referring to both of them uh, to the point that you were making. I think USADF actually has a long history of working in diaspora communities uh, just because of the weight and import that they have on the continent, right? So I think recent reports from as late as 2021 are that the diaspora communities in the United States are sending more in remittances back to the continent actually than all of uh, federal, uh, excuse me, foreign direct investment or equal to all uh, the official development assistance. And so obviously this is a powerful constitu constituency to engage. So there's a couple. First, we, we have one partner uh, called the African Diaspora Network, uh, and they're based out of Silicon Valley. Uh, it is run and started uh, by an Ethiopian American uh, woman uh, by the name of Almaz Nagash, uh, and they're doing economic development and assistance training. Uh, they're doing support uh, to diaspora uh, businesses inside the U.S., but the part on which we partner with them is their training program uh, and grants that we give um, to African entrepreneurs uh, in the United States who's actually, who actually have businesses that are going or uh, entrepreneurship uh, ventures that they're participating in that are happening actually directly on the continent uh, of Africa. The other thing uh, is in our partnership with the NBA Players Association Foundation. You have uh, a mix of African continental players, uh, but also African American players. Um, who essentially we're partnering with to do programming uh, along the lines of what USADF focuses on either in their countries of origin 
or in their country of interest if it is a diasporan who does not actually know uh, their country uh, of origin um, on the continent. Uh, also recently uh, at the African Leaders Summit, we launched or we announced uh, the launch of what is going to be called uh, our annual diaspora uh, award. And this is an award of up to $100,000 uh, in grants that would go uh, to an African diasporan who is doing impactful work for women and youth in any of the entrepreneurial avenues that we fund uh, on the continent uh, of Africa. So those are several ways in which we do it. Uh, we thank uh, members of Congress who have supported us in doing that work, uh, specifically members of the Congressional Black Caucus who've wanted to ensure that we have language and funding uh, around diaspora engagement um, that ultimately helps us to have a greater impact uh, on the continent. And so uh, these are things that we think about and talk about all the time uh, and certainly are at the front of mind. Hi there, my name is Kyla Denwood. I'm a research assistant at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace's Africa program, as well as the newly elected vice president for education and exchange um, with the Black Professionals in International Affairs. Um, it really struck me your experience uh, encouraging elementary school students to learn more about European decolonization. And my question is, how do we as policy experts, as civil society leaders and academics engage with an even younger audience um, to give them a more nuanced perspective of what Africa is and what they can bring to the table? Yeah, uh, well, I'll tell, you, I'll tell you what I did, uh, Kyla, which was really uh, a lot of fun for me. Um, the first thing was that these were kids who had come from environments that I was very familiar with. I had been a kid in environments like that myself, uh, where uh, there's a certain kind of attitude about um, your space, your personal space, your physical space, uh, your right to exist, uh, the dignity that you carry in your bearing. Uh, and so it was very easy for me to get them to understand just by saying, hey, what if somebody came into a space uh, where you were living or where you were working or that you were occupying and claimed it um, as their own and told you that you had to speak their language, told you you had to accept their religion, told you you had to live under the law that they set up, not the law of your ancestors or the law of your tradition or the law of your own legacy, right? And then immediately they start kind of sitting, sitting up, right? Because where we come from, this is not okay, <laughs> right? <laughs> And so, and so that's where the hook came in. Uh, and then essentially what happened was I said, listen, some countries fought, some countries negotiated, some countries had other means through the United Nations or the League of Nations at the time to figure out their way towards their independence. And whatever country they had, uh, they had to carry out that path. And so what you have uh, is folks learning uh, skills in negotiation, and arbitration, uh, folks learning about the United Nations system and its history, folks learning about that, hey, sometimes people chose uh, the path of violent resistance. Uh, and so one of the, the tougher ones was there was a group that had one on uh, the French and the uh, Algerians, right? And anybody who knows this history knows this is one of the bloodiest colonial histories um, on the continent. And so I said, look, I need uh, 40 uh, super soaker water guns, right? And so in a way, these kids are going out in this big field and having a water gun fight, but if you stop them to talk to them, they would say, oh no, we're part of the FLM and the French have to go and Ahmad Ben Bella is, you know, they're, they're giving it to you, right? <laughs> While they're having fun doing this thing. Uh, and the biggest compliment I got from one of the kids is she said, uh, she said, Mr. Atkins, you had the only class I didn't fall asleep in, <laughs> right? And so, I, th I think we did, we did something right, but I think there's a, a way in which this history is very basic, right? We can make it complicated if we want to, but at the end of the day, one people decided that another people was unworthy to have what was rightfully theirs, uh, decided to come up with legal schemes to take it away from them, political schemes to take it away from them, military schemes to take it away from them, and then to have that justified uh, in the world. And so after, of course, the end of World War II, that world starts to recede and you start to hear about respect for human rights and dignity and sovereignty, right? Uh, but we should have a clear understanding of how the world we live in today 
came to be. Uh, and I think that that is what I was curious about when I was young. Uh, and I think it is for a lot of young people who are dissatisfied with the conditions under which they live. They don't know how it came to be. They don't know what they can do uh, about it. And so that has been, uh, again, the mission uh, of my life and work. Uh, yeah, over here. Yes. Hi. Oh, this is working. Hi. Perfect. Hi, Mr. Atkins. Thank you for being here today. My name is Kayla Smith. I am a second year mayor candidate. I'm also a 2021 Charles B. Rangel Fellow, and I humbly serve as the vice president of the SICE Black Student Union. I have two questions for you. I'll make them as brief as possible. My first question is, you present as a storyteller, and I would love to know how your foundation engages in storytelling in the continent in terms of the engagements you guys uh, work in. And my second question for you is, you've had a robust career. How do you maintain your stamina for the work that you do? Yeah, great. Two great questions. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, the first thing I would say, and I think I have a few colleagues here that know uh, that storytelling for me really is everything, right? Because when you look at history, right, obviously it has the word story right there in it. Uh, and the arc of what that history is can determine uh, life or death for people, poverty or wealth uh, for people, success or failure for people. Uh, and sometimes it's because of what happened that created the story, but sometimes it's because of the way the story is being told, right? And essentially what my mother was saying to me uh, is that there has been a story told about people like me and you, son, and people like the people where we come from, son, and those stories are not true, right? And you set out on a course really to change that narrative, right? Because the narrative was created to justify one group being able to be the leader and another group being designated as a follower. One group being called a master, another group having to be enslaved. One group being a colonizer, uh, another group being a subjugated or subject people, right? Those all come from stories and narrative. Uh, and to change those, because I, I think part of the challenge we have in the modern world is that some of the conditions have changed, but the narrative of what people believe has not changed. And that's why women still have a struggle in America and in the world. Muslims still have a struggle in America and in the world. The members of the LGBTQ plus community still have a struggle. Uh, in America and in the world because the story that has been told about them is that they don't belong or that they are <coughs> undeserving or that they don't have the same levels of competence. And so everybody that's in a body that has been designated by those uh, narratives uh, is fighting a fight uh, to try to overcome them. And so for me, uh, it's paramount. And, and I think that one of the ways that I do it is by talking like this openly. Right, taking the things that people think are controversial and saying them calmly and out loud. Right, it shouldn't be controversial to say that women deserve the same kinds of opportunities as men. It shouldn't be controversial to say that black people are not inferior to anybody. It shouldn't be controversial to say that no matter your sexual orientation or gender uh, identity, you deserve the same dignity and opportunities in America because that's what our nation is promising. And so I think the more we do it uh, and say it out loud into microphones, on cameras, and take pictures of it, uh, <laughs> that we begin to continue to make the case uh, for the nation that we say we want to have. Uh, in terms of stamina, that's also a great question and, and it's something that I would uh, share with young people uh, about you know, now there's this thing about the soft life or there's all this stuff about self-care, right? Um, well, I'm not too old, but I, I'm, I'm old enough that I didn't come from a, uh, a people who thought that that was something uh, that you should necessarily uh, prioritize. It's called work, not fun, right, that people, people, people would say. Uh, but I do think it's paramount uh, to take care of ourselves, and to take care of yourself actually is to take care of the people that you care about. And so putting off what sustains you striving after something that you won't even be here for if you don't take care of yourself doesn't make any sense. And so now this is just life advice to students because I think when we get stressed out, whether it's with our class, our work, our relationships, whatever, 
the things that are the most sustaining for us are the first things to go. I'm not eating right because I got all this stuff going on. I'm not sleeping because I got all this stuff going on. I'm not exercising because I got all this stuff going on. You're not going to have anything going on if you don't get those three things in your life uh, figured out. Uh, and then I think uh, the last thing I would say is for me, I'm so fortunate because I found my North Star very early. There was never anything else I wanted to be or to do or to try to figure out than what was happening in communities like mine, what was happening to people who had come out of the history I had come out of, and how could I develop the skills and talents that I was given uh, to give back to the people uh, essentially who had given me uh, my life. And so every day, um, that's what I'm waking up to do. Uh, and not having any confusion about that uh, has been, I think, the best thing for me. Because I didn't have, when I came to college or grad school, oh, I'm still trying to figure out my, you know, no, I didn't have any of that. I was here, I knew, and I went for it. Uh, and it's fine if people don't have that, uh, but we ought to be looking for it, right? We ought to be looking for it. And it's not about what you major in necessarily. It's about what is the thing that drives you crazy about the way that our world or our society is set up uh, in a way that you want to spend uh, life, part of your life, part of your career, trying to figure out how to contribute to the solution uh, for that uh, in a positive way. So I can't think of a more powerful note to, to end our conversation. And I, just as an aside, you know, it, it's great having Wrangell Fellows here. Um, I had the privilege, I worked in the Senate for a number of years, and I had the privilege of working with Congressman Wrangell, who was an extraordinary figure, an extraordinary leader, um, both on issues here at home, but also in Africa. And, and he was a powerful voice. And, and that, and you know, it is that kind of leadership that, that we need, and we look to all of our young students to be the next generation, just like we're privileged to have you here to, to give this message. It's a powerful message, uh, both of the work you do and the, the values that you hold that, that mean so much to us here, because that's what we're all about. However people choose to pursue that passion, we're about passion, about making a difference, and I don't think there's any, any of us would, uh, uh, disagree or have any question about the difference that you've made and, uh, and the example that you set for all of us. So thank you for being here today. Thank you.